The Master Liquid ML360R RGB is a new all-in-one by Cooler Master that sports a 360mm radiator, addressable RGB fans, and a low-profile dual-chamber pump. The nicely sleeved FEP tubing has a premium feel, and you can use the included RGB control unit to customize the addressable LEDs on the fans and pump, or plug directly into your motherboard. For more on the Master Liquid ML360R RGB, click the sponsor link in the video's description. Excellent! Hello everyone and welcome to my GeForce RTX 2070 launch review video. Here you will find some benchmarks and some testing results for these new GPUs with comparisons to the RTX 2080 and 2080 Ti, as well as the GTX 1080 Ti, GTX 1080, and AMD Radeon Vega 64. I tested in 4K, 1440, and 1080, so feel free to jump forward in this video to this time code and you can watch those immediately. But if you're gonna stick with me for a few moments, I do have a few things to point out about this launch. Here is the Founders Edition RTX 2070. You might note that these are just still images because I do not actually have this GPU in hand. I do have the Founders Editions of the 2080 and 2080 Ti, which Nvidia provided to us reviewers when those launched, but the Founders Edition 2070s are supposed to cost $600, whereas the entry level price for an RTX 2070 is $500. Nvidia hasn't sampled any of the Founders Edition cards to the press, to my knowledge at least, so what you're gonna see today from myself as well as other reviewers is eerily similar videos where anyone who's reviewing a higher end card like this uh, MSI RTX 2070 Gaming Z will also be required to cover a $500 version of this card like the MSI RTX 2070 Armor and everyone will be using aftermarket GPUs rather than Founders Editions. Now I think Nvidia made this decision for a very specific purpose and that is to make sure that as we reviewers are showing you price to performance graphs, we will take the $500 price into consideration as opposed to only talking about the higher end price for the Founders Edition like we did with the RTX 2080 Ti launch. Most reviewers for that launch, myself included, used the Founders Edition price of $1,200 to show the value proposition because that's supposedly what you can actually buy one for, at least if you can find a 2080 Ti in stock. For what it's worth though, today I tested both of these cards, so I will be sharing both sets of numbers, the overclocked from the manufacturer Gaming Z, as well as the base clock set of numbers from the armor. I did want to point out this requirement though, because we actually rarely get rules or restrictions placed on how we do reviews as independent review outlets, so this was a different way of doing things from my experience with Nvidia in the past. If the upshot is that there are actually RTX 2070s widely available for $500 on the retail launch day, which is in two days on the 18th, I'm okay with it, but we will have to wait and see if that is actually the case. Either way, I wanted to let you guys know what's going on. Let's quickly cover some of the basic stats for the RTX 2070 though. If you watch the 2080 and 2080 Ti launch, then you'll probably already be familiar with some of the tech. The RTX 2070 is based on the TU106 GPU from Nvidia, which is built on Turing architecture. That means it features tensor cores for hardware-based AI acceleration, and now also ray tracing or RT cores for hardware accelerated real-time ray tracing. Given the timing of this launch, which is the same week that the Intel 99K launches, if you guys didn't notice, and the lack of software that actually supports these new technologies as far as demonstrating and benchmarking them, I will not be testing AI or ray tracing today, instead focusing on my gaming comparison tests that I used for the 2080 Ti launch and showing you how these cards stack up in those tests. We should see a benefit in my testing from the Turing architectural change to an independent integer data path though, which allows integer and floating point operations to run concurrently, which should boost asynchronous compute performance. More specifically though, when compared to the RTX 2080, the RTX 2080 2070 has 2,304 CUDA cores versus the 2080's 2,944. Still has the same eight gigabyte configuration of 14 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory on a 256 bit bus. And it does have a TDP that's a bit lower at 175 watts for the uh, standard edition, 185 watts for the founders edition versus the 2080's TDPs of 215 and 225 watts for the standard and founders edition. One last thing I wanted to say before we get into the benchmarks is that the Dash 70 GPUs from Nvidia have four a very long time been in the $350 to $450 range with great bang for the buck performance and a worthy entry to the high-end GPU market range that could you could claw your way up to by saving your pennies even if you didn't have that much money to work with. But they're just not anymore. $500 to $600 is a big jump in base price and while there may be some justification from Nvidia's point of view due to lack of competition from Radeon, it just kind of sucks that this card is so much less accessible to so many potential PC builders 
builders due to the price increase, especially when you compare it to the place in the market that the GTX 970 and GTX 1070 sat at. So if you look at these prices and you don't want that thought to depress you, you just have to kind of remind yourself that the 2070 is more of a replacement for the GTX 1080, not the GTX 1070. And I don't really see that changing until we have new high-end graphics cards from AMD to compete with these. On to the benchmarks though, and due to extreme lack of time this week, I'm using my existing 2080 Ti launch review suite of software and games and benchmark results that you can play right now, and these include a mix of DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 titles. The test system that I am using is right here, and it is fairly small. It's got an Intel Core i7 8700K, six core 12 thread CPU at 4.6 gigahertz with a 4.8 gigahertz turbo on one or two cores at once. An Asus ROG Strix Z370-i gaming motherboard, which is small but powerful, a G Flare X kit of 16 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, two by eight gigs. That's running at cast latency 14. And I've got a CryoRig H7 CPU cooler on top with two Noctua NF-A12 X25 PWM fans, 120 millimeter fans and push pull. And then for storage, a main SSD operating system drive is a Samsung 960 Pro NVMe M.2 512 gig SSD. My comparison cards are the Asus ROG Strix GTX 1080 Ti 11 gig overclocked version, the Asus ROG Strix Radeon Vega 64, eight gigs of HBM2 on that one, also overclocked, and the EVGA GTX 1080 for the win 2, which has GDDR5X and is also manufacturer overclocked. And now let's take a look at the benchmarking numbers themselves. The key comparison here, I think, is going to be between the RTX 2070 and the GTX 1080, since those are supposedly around the same price um, when it comes to what's available right now. My first test here is 3D Mark Firestrike Ultra 4K test, and here we have an overall score as well as the graphics score. The graphics score is probably a little bit more important. And here I want to point out the big jump that the Gaming Z gets, and that's due to the frequency that it's getting at. We'll talk about that when we get to the end of the benchmark numbers, but uh, got a nice 500 point boost here and that allowed it to catch up to and overtake the 1080 for the win too. Next up is 3D Mark Time Spy. This is a DirectX 12 test and here I think we can see the asynchronous compute performance of the new 20 series actually showing through as even the base clock version scored 8392 in the graphics test which is a nice boost up over the overclocked GTX 1080 score of 7576. Also worth noting that while these numbers are pretty impressive compared to the Vega 64 and the GTX 1080, it's still well back of the 1080 Ti as well as the 2080 and 2080 Ti's performance. Next up is VRMark Blue Room, a VR specific test. And here the 2070, both the Armor and Gaming Z performed very well, scoring 2,600 and 3,000 respectively. A very nice jump up over the GTX 1080 for the win too. VR can provide a unique challenge to some GPUs depending on the software being tested, of course, but it's nice to see the 20 series excelling in this test. Next is Ashes of the Singularity Escalation, also DirectX 12, uh, affectionately known as Ashes of the Benchmark because no one actually plays this game. It's only used for benchmarks, but still a good test. And we can see that with the overclock speed of the MSI Gaming Z, it was able to catch up to and overtake the 1080 for the win too. And here's where we can see that where the 1080 does win, uh, actually it might be just a clock speed differential there. And by overclock, in 2070, you can catch up. Moving over to 2560 by 1440, and we have a dead heat between the 2070 MSI Gaming Z and the EVGA GTX 1080 for the win too. They scored exactly the same, which is rare, but um, that shows you that in some tests, we're pretty much evenly matched between these two cards. And then finally for 1920 by 1080, we do see the GTX 1080 for the win too, pulling ahead, uh, but it's really just by about one frame per second. Our next test is Rise of the Tomb Raider. This is our last DirectX 12 test, and I'm not using Shadow of the Tomb Raider just yet, but I will switch to that soon. At 4K, the 2070 Gaming Z wins once again with an average frame rate of 47 FPS. That beats out the 1080 for the win too with a uh, frame rate of 40.8. Although again, uh, both of these cards are staying well behind the 1080 Ti. So if you are considering a higher end, $600 plus 2070, then the 1080 Ti becomes even more of a compelling alternative. At 2560, by 1440, the lead increases even more with the uh, average frame rate of 89.8 frames per second for the 2070 Gaming Z. And then finally at 1920 by 1080, we do become a little bit more CPU bound, so it does even out a little bit more. Uh, but once again, Gaming Z wins with 129.3. Next up is GTA 5 testing in 4K at 3840 by 2160. The 2070 MSI Gaming Z comes in at 65 frames per second. The armor dropping in at 61 FPS, just a little bit behind. And then the 1080 for the win too 
2 coming in with 56 frames per second. If we jump over to 1440, it evens out just a little bit, but the Gaming Z wins once again with an average frame rate of 121 frames per second. Again, we're still well behind the 1080 Ti and 2080 Founders Edition, which are up in the 140 FPS range. But if we move over to 1920 by 1080, everything evens out as we become a little bit more CPU bound and we're all scoring around 150 frames per second. Here's Total War Warhammer 2 at 4K. We are running the campaign benchmarking sequence and the 2070 Armor and Gaming Z are within a few frames of each other at 44 and 41 frames per second respectively. Again, this is still well behind the 2080 and 2080 Ti, but uh, just edges out the GTX 1080 for the win too. At 2560 by 1440, we have more of the same with an average frame rate of 75 frames per second for the MSI Gaming Z RTX 2070. This is still well behind, again, the max score of the 2080 Ti founder edition which got up to 113 so you do still get a nice boost from the 2080 ti here of course it, it does cost twice as much so i guess you get what you pay for at 1920 by 1080 we again have the overall frame rates evening out just a little bit as at lower resolutions we do become a little bit more cpu bound battlefield one is next at 4k we were getting 66 average frames per second with the msi gaming z so well over 60 frames per second even the one percent lows were only at 56 so if you're on a standard 4k 60 hertz monitor the 2070 should get you by with battle field one. Moving over to 2560 by 1440, we have 120 average frames per second, so maybe a 1440 high refresh rate monitor is also a nice pairing for an RTX 2070, at least on a slightly better budget than the RTX 2080. And then finally at 1920 by 1080, we have 159 average frames per second uh, with 151 average frames per second for the slightly lower clocked MSI Armor RTX 2070, and both of these again beat out the 1080 for the win too. Our final test is Overwatch, and this is on epic settings with 100% render scale. Remember, Overwatch has a lot of scaling and graphics options, so you can get better frame rates than what I'm showing you here with these graphics cards by just tweaking those a little bit. But if you want the maximum eye candy, you'll get about 82 frames per second at 4K with an overclocked RTX 2070, such as the MSI Gaming Z. If you jump to 2560 by 1440, uh, this is actually a great solution again for a high refresh rate monitor, such as a 120 hertz, 144 hertz option you're getting 160 average frames per second and only dipping down to 138 for the 1% lows. And finally, if you want max frame rates, you're getting about uh, 220 to 240 frames per second with an RTX 2070, depending on the clock speed, of course, here. That's still well below what you can get with a maxed out 2080 Founders Edition or a 1080 Ti, for example, but still well over what you would need for any reasonably specced high refresh rate 1920 by 1080 monitor. Here's a chart comparing the frequencies of the different GPUs. I was testing the base and boost clock as listed from the manufacturer, as well as the max testing frequency, and then the average testing frequency while the GPU is under load and actually had some heat built up in it. So you can actually see a really big jump from the MSI Armor to the MSI Gaming Z here, going from that boost clock of 1620 with the Armor all the way up to 1830, over 200 megahertz boost with the Gaming Z. That is potentially something you could do on your own. I am not overclocking in this video here, but MSI makes afterburner overclocking software, and you should be able to go in and just turn up the GPU frequency of this card here. You might be limited based on the performance of the cooler or the ASIC quality of the GPU itself, but it is worth noting that if you're willing to do a little bit of overclocking, you can save yourself 100 bucks overclock this GPU and probably get a lot closer to the performance of this GPU here. That said, and something I'm not sure about, but hopefully we'll be covering very soon in the future, I'm not sure if there are actually different GPUs for the base frequency versions of these that are not allowed to be manufacturer overclocks and the manufacturer overclock versions, and if there's any significant ASIC quality between those that would indicate that yes, you do need to spend more if you want to get max frequency, or yes, you can spend less and just overclock this and get yourself, if not the same frequency, something that's in the ballpark. I don't want to get too distracted with that though because I didn't actually overclock these for right now, so let's just talk about the frequencies they're running at. The Gaming Z hit 1995 megahertz max frequency, whereas the Armor hit 1860, over 100 megahertz less, and then the actual frequency that they're running at was about 1950, so pretty close to 2 gigahertz on the Gaming Z and then 1710 on the Armor. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, you'll notice a pretty big jump in performance 
performance with the Gaming Z, but you could easily narrow that gap with the armor by taking it and overclocking it a little bit. I just can't speak to how good of an overclocker these base level cards are. When it comes to power draw though, you actually do draw a decent amount more power when you're running at the higher frequency. We saw an average power draw of 274 watts with the armor, whereas that average jumped up about 50 watts to 328 with the Gaming Z. So you do lose a little bit of efficiency there and trade off for the added performance. And then finally for temperatures, the coolers did seem to do a pretty good job. We hit 68 degrees Celsius max on the armor and 69 degrees Celsius max on the Gaming Z. So it would also indicate that both of these cards have some potential overclocking headroom in the future, especially the armor. And finally, here's the money shot, the TLDR slide. For those of you who just want the overall performance, this is it. Weighted against the GTX 1080 or using that as a baseline with 100% of the score, we have 103% performance from the RTX 2070 MSI armor and then 10% more with the 2070 MSI Gaming Z. And then up from there, the 2080 is 27% faster and so on. Also here you can see the prices that I've chosen for these cards, which I tried to base on prices that are currently available for cards that are roughly in the same ballpark as the ones I was testing. And here, if we're looking at price versus performance, we can see the standouts are gonna be the GTX 1080 and then the $500 version of the RTX 2070. $600 version is still on there too, but it is kind of outshined by its less expensive little brother. And finally, just to boil things way down, I took the performance and the price and I did a little math and I came out with the points per dollar number here. So 200 points is what your 1080 for 500 bucks gets. And here we can see that the 2070 MSI armor is giving us just a little bit more value with 206 points. The GTX 1080 Ti is also a standout with 191. So that's showing that even with the price still at $700, the 1080 Ti is still coming out as a value proposition amongst this batch of high-end graphics cards. Going further down the list, we can see we lose more and more value as we go to the 2070, the Vega 64, and then of course the 2080 and 2080 Ti. So ultimately the closest competitor of the RTX 2070 is, uh, well not the RTX 2080, that is the GTX 1080. And the GTX 1080 has been all over the place in terms of pricing. So please bear in mind for my price to performance numbers there, things do fluctuate so I can't account for all of that. But the fact is, if the RTX GTX 2070 was launching at the same price or even the ballpark same price as the GTX 1070 launched at two years ago, which was $400, maybe a little over $400, I'd be telling everyone to buy this card. It's what you want. It's got stuff for the future technology, ray tracing and everything. Even though we can't test that yet, I'd be like, we'll buy it because it's a good value. And then you'll have that technology once the software becomes made available for it. At the price of $500 or $600, it becomes so much more muddied and so much more confusing to try to give you guys good advice on what you should do and in fact it becomes much more of the same story that we told with the RTX 2080 when it launched which is this is insanely overpriced and you have to very seriously consider a 1080 Ti by comparison and what that costs. Speaking of cost, just somewhat anecdotally for this video, here is what you can get a 1080 Ti for right now, around $700. That's still pretty expensive and those prices have come back up from what they were before. If you're looking at the GTX 1070 or 1070 Ti, well those start at $360. 1070 Ti you can get for $385 and the cheapest 1080 I found was only $440. To be fair, here's also a look at Radeon Vega 56s, which are currently starting around $420 to $440. Vega 64s start at $500. But ultimately, it's, it's just a very difficult recommendation to make, I think, right now. So I will say, with the prices of the GTX 1070s, that's probably still my go-to right now for a nice balance of excellent performance, as well as a price that isn't going to take you up into the $600 plus range. The 2070 is a viable option, and it's maybe a little bit more of a viable price to performance option than say the 2080 is, but it's still very expensive, and I'd say you still are having to rely a little bit on that potential future performance of ray tracing and AI, um, which you can't really validate for sure right now. So I think the final question is gonna be for these entry level $500 versions of the cards that the manufacturers cannot ship to you, manufacturer overclocked, how will they overclock? Is it really gonna be held back very much? Is there a significant difference between the ASIC quality of the overclock from the manufacturer versions and the entry level versions? And that information 
information is information I do not have to share with you right now. And even if I did, it would be somewhat anecdotal because I only have one of these to test. But I'll come back to that in the future. I think for now, you do get all around solid performance with the RTX 2070. Definitely an edge up versus the GTX 1080 and DirectX 12 titles as well as VR and 4K gaming, but only slight and maybe not significant enough to warrant the higher price, especially when you can get GTX 1080s for 450 bucks right now. That's all I have to say for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed it and definitely hit the thumbs up button if you did and also subscribe because I got more videos coming at you very soon. I'm actually immediately going right now to start or continue testing on the 9900K, so I should have a video up for you guys on that very soon. And that's all I have for now. Thanks again for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.